Now, just because the world around us is increasingly anxious doesn't mean we need to be. Now, last we were in a two-week series, just a little, little, little quick glance at one of the issues that is among the most pressing of our time. If you were to ask any person under the age of 25, probably under the age of 30, possibly even under the age of 40, what the top five problems in the world are, I promise you, mental health will be in the top five. I promise you. Test me on that. If you know anybody under the age of, of 25, ask them. Because every, every recent survey shows that the younger you are, the more the anxiety levels are rising in society. Uh, we looked at a survey last week where among um, those under, I think it was under the age of 25, is a 135% increase in anxiety disorders since 2012. So it's rising quickly. We live in an increasingly anxious world. And we looked at some of the reasons behind that potentially. Um, and so last week, especially, we looked at some of the breakdown that's, that's happening in the community structures, tribe, things like that. And, and now here's the reason why I, I, I so want us to kind of engage on this issue, is when you think of the things that Jesus promises for his disciples, things that he longs for us to have, right near the top of the list is peace. I mean, the, the fundamental Jewish um, greeting is shalom. Turn to your neighbor and say shalom. Shalom. That word means peace. And that means not just a, uh, an absence of conflict, but a presence of wholeness, a presence of wellness, that all things in your life would be in their right place, that there would be peace. Or you think of, of Jesus' words in Matthew eleven twenty eight: 28, come to me. All you who are weary and heavy laden, let me see your eyes, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke on you. Learn from me, for I am humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. That is the heart of our Savior for his people. Peace I give you. My peace I leave you. I don't give you peace like the world gives. And so we've been taking a look at this really powerful promise that we see in uh, the book of Philippians. In this case, it's actually through the lips of the Apostle Paul, but to the church in Philippi. But it, it tells us not only, like, reminds us of God's promise that we can know a surpassing peace regardless of our circumstances, but it tells us how to get there. So I... I'm, this is a passage I'm hoping we commit to memory, so we're going to read it out loud together. And then we're going to look at, um, well, two aspects of that passage that we tend to overlook in Western culture, among other reasons, because of limitations of the English language. So we're going to take a, a, a look at a couple of angles in this biblical promise that maybe you haven't thought about or haven't thought about in a while. So let's take a look first at the biblical promise, Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Let's say them together out loud, okay? Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, that's a biblical promise we need to hang on to. Now, last week, we looked at one aspect of that biblical promise that we easily overlook because English lacks a second person plural. You see, every part of this promise, though it is true for you individually, it is even more true. The fullness of that promise is given to a church corporately. The letter of Phil the Philippians was written to the church in Philippi. It wasn't just written to Phil. It, so it's a corporate promise. So I had us uh, read a, a lesser known 
much less important translation called Andrew's Southern Translation from the AST, where we're going to actually voice out the second person plural. So let's do that together because it's helpful that we hear this because this is, this is actually original to the text. This is actually originally in the Greek. Um, and, and it's not that there's been any conspiracy. It's just that we, because proper English does not contain second person plural, which is why if we want to understand it well, we need to go with a maybe even better form, Southern English, because Southern English has got the second person plural, y'all. So we're not making fun of anything. We're not making fun of anything from the South, but we're, we're pulling that aspect of the Southern dialect into our biblical reading so we understand the Bible more clearly and we understand God's promise more clearly. So let's read from the, from the AST, Andrew Southern Translation. Here we go, y'all. Read it with me. Y'all, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, y'all present y'all's requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard y'all's hearts and y'all's minds in Christ Jesus. So we looked at one of the things that is, that is, it is a factor, a factor, I believe, in the increase in anxiety is that we have actually seen a bit of a breakdown, especially in Western culture, we've seen a breakdown of tribe. That we have a, a lesser sense of corporate responsibility for one another. And so I issued the challenge. If you are a follower of Christ, you are a tribe builder. You are a village builder. And if we, if we want to restore that aspect, and I hope we do, of American culture, we need to be people who get to know our neighbors. And while we may not be able to get ourselves back to some of the environments that you and I were raised in with free-range parenting and all that super cool stuff that we were raised with, and you were able to run around the neighborhood and you only come back when the lights come on and you hear the cowbell to come back for dinner and, you know, you, you, and your neighbor could tell you off and all that good stuff that you were raised with, we may not have the ability to just flip a light switch and make that happen. I mean, it is really hard being a parent today. Really hard. But here's what we can do, is, we, is we, can, we can bring that awareness into the local church. And we can take a degree of responsibility for one another. Because if you are part of a healthy local church, you don't go any, through anything alone. We are part of the body of Christ. In fact, if you are a follower of Jesus, you're part of the body of Christ, whether you like it or not. And so all these weird people around you, on some level, we are connected to one another. Like it or not. One big, happy, dysfunctional family. You got to invite your weird uncle to, the, to, to Thanksgiving dinner. And in a similar kind of way, even though we may not always like one another, we are called to love one another. And we're called to have one another's best interest at heart. So if you want to make the world better, be a tribal builder. We looked at that. So I want to look at one other aspect in the, in, that we also miss in, in, in this passage. Now, I don't know if you caught this, but on, in the version that, we, that was projected, there was a word that was underlined. Now, you, you, some of you are really paying attention. What word was that? Present, because that's the action word. So don't be anxious about anything, but in all, all things, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present present your request to God. That's the action word. That's the verb there. Now, quick little Greek lesson. Um, there is a Greek word tense that while it exists in English, we may not understand the fullness of what it means in English. Here's what I mean. The word present, present your requests to God, is in what's called the present tense. How convenient. The present tense, which means this is something that you do and continue to do. So present your requests to God. It is not a one and done. Not a one and done. Though I should point out, just like, like this, the promise is corporate more than individual. 
I mean, if, if you call out to God, you will probably feel something. I mean, you are in a desperate situation, even if it's your first time calling out to God. God, please help. Chances are something is going to happen. That's because God always keeps his promises. And the fullness of this biblical promise. Y'all present and keep presenting your requests to God. You got to keep doing it. It's, it's got to become a habit or the word I want to play with today and just introduce some language for you that I really hope is helpful. I hope this is one of those things you go, oh, I'll be thinking about this for a while. Is make it a ritual. Now, I, saw, I realize some of you are ex-Catholics. It's okay. You, you can call me Father Thompson. That'd be, funny. That'd be so cool. Yeah. All right, I've been tempted sometimes to wear a clerical collar just to get, because you, they'll let you into any place if you wear a clerical collar. Anyways, <clears throat> okay, one quick side note. Okay, I got this. I'm going to get back on track real fast, but I got to share like a one minute story that was really kind of funny. So I, I, was, um, I was training as a, as a, ch as a chaplain and in, in seminary. And for a, so for a, for a summer, I was a, I was a hospital chaplain at a level one trauma center in Evanston, Illinois. And so we'd go up there with my cohort and we'd be doing this. And, and um, I was kind of the token evangelical in the group. They were all like weirded out by me because I kept quoting Bible verses. They didn't know what to do. Um, and, but one of the other guys in the group had a couple of Lutherans and there was a Catholic priest training to be a Catholic priest up there. So he would wear the collar all the time. And he was pretty new to the priesthood and he had this really hot car. So he was driving north uh, up to Evanston one day, and, and he told us this story. I thought it was hilarious. He goes driving up, nor uh, up north towards Evanston, and a car cut him off in traffic. And he's only training to be a priest, and unfortunately, there was a, there was a pre-Christian reflex <laughs> that happened for him. And so he comes into the group, he says, guys, I flipped someone off <laughs> on, the, on the way to class today. And, and then I realized I was wearing my clerical collar. Like, can you imagine what that would be like? That, I would just so want to take a picture of that. That would just, it's rude, but man, that would be the best. Okay. <laughs> now, where was I? Okay. So we present our requests. We present our request to God, it's an, ongoing, it's an ongoing thing. The fullness of the promise is to a community together. So it's worth asking this question. So how did they do that? How did the early church do that? What was that like for them? And, and so I want to actually uh, read a bit of a document that may be new to you that's not in the Bible, so hang on, so this is yellow card, proceed with caution, okay? It's not in the Bible, um, but it is a document of the early church called the Didache. Now, um, historians tell us that this, this document comes, was written somewhere between AD 50 and AD 60. So really, really early on in Christian history. This, this was a, a um, well, it's basically a little handbook. Uh, that was written about the time that the New Testament was written. And it tells us like what the early church did. And now it's not really like scripture, so there's a good reason why it didn't make the Bible. It, it's anonymous authorship. We don't know exactly who wrote it. And maybe even more to the point is it reads like an HR manual. Um, and now I'm not here, and this is not trying to make fun of anybody in HR, but uh, w when you're writing policies for a business, it's important right? It's important. But does anybody really want to read it? No, they really don't. You know, it's important writing, but it's not, it's not really inspiring writing. It's just kind of like, this is how you get stuff done. So there was basically this HR manual in the early church called the Didache, been well preserved. It was, it was well distributed, but it's not part of scripture. But it tells us something that I think is vitally important about how the early church lived this out. Now, this doesn't mean we need to do it exactly the same way, 
but it's important that we learn from it. Here's why, just before we get to the passage. One of the larger questions in the church as we look at the early church is how did the early church make it out of the first century? Like how did this tiny little group in, this, in kind of the armpit of the Roman Empire, how did this religion change the world? Now, I totally understand how the first generation of Christians live with such boldness. I mean, the big church answer for that is the resurrection. I mean, hundreds of people saw Jesus raised from the dead. Their lives were completely changed by it. They were utterly convinced they would face the sword rather than deny what they saw. I mean, the resurrection is a historic fact. Go as deep as you want with that. It is fact. So I totally understand how the first generation of Christians lived with such boldness. But here's the part that should blow our minds. That, that even though Christianity was ostracized, it was marginalized, it was at times directly persecuted. In AD 312, it became the religion of the Roman Empire. It won. How did this happen? How did not only, I mean, we understand why the first generation of Christians lived with boldness. It's harder to understand why their great grandkids were still on fire for Jesus. What did they do that helped to pass down that kind of faith so that by AD 312, as the Emperor Constantine has this really weird dream, and we could talk about all that. Um, by the, by the year AD 312, historians tell us that somewhere between 10 and 20% of the Roman Empire was already Christian. Already Christian. And this in the midst of a church that was largely worshiping underground. That, I mean, if there's other early church documents, including sections of the Didache that we're about to read from. That, that prescribed, like, for somebody to get baptized, there would be a year-long preparation process. You would not be allowed to attend a worship service until you'd gone through multiple steps, because otherwise you are a security risk. That's how the early church lived. And yet by AD 312, every person in the Roman Empire knew a Christian. And they respected them. They may not share their faith, but they're like, oh, this is somebody I want to do business with because they live differently. So by AD 312, they passed down this robust faith to the next generation. Here's why I especially believe this is important. And I promise we'll get to this, to this concept. Is See, we are on the cusp of a new era of history. Something that has not existed for 1,700 years in the West. We are on the cusp of Christianity being the faith minority. Now, some people would say we have already passed into a post-Christian culture. But we are now, for the first time in 1,700 years in the, in the West, or we are about to be. It's happening in our, in our lifetime, folks. Where the majority of people, soon to be, if not already the case. The majority of people have very little understanding of who Jesus is or was. And where general Christian morality is possibly disliked, at very least it's apathetic towards it. Like, who cares? Who cares what that old fangled, whatever that was. We are, become, we are into a post christian we're moving into a post-Christian culture for the first time in the West in 1700 years, which is why I believe it is vitally important that we look at what the early church did in the first 300 years. Because something, something from back then can tell us how to live better now. Because I don't know about you, I want my faith to be passed on to my children and my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren. In fact, I think that is the most important issue in the church today. I think it's the most important issue in culture today is whether or not a meaningful, robust Christian faith, like a, like a love affair with Jesus gets passed on to your great-grandchildren. I think that matters. 
which is why I think it's helpful for us to learn from the early church, because somehow they got something right. Again, that doesn't mean we need to do it in exactly the same way, but our history matters. So let's read a little bit from the Didache. Here we go. So in the Didache chapter 8, it reads this. And do not pray as the hypocrites, but as the Lord commanded in the gospel, pray thus. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so also upon earth. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into trial, but deliver us from the evil one, for thine is the power and the glory forever. Does that sound familiar to you? Now here's the part. Here's the other part in chapter 8 that's important. Pray this three times a day. Pray thus three times a day. Now, presumably, the early church continued in the, in the Jewish tradition of praying in the morning, at noon, and in the evening, at least three times a day. So a little bit after sunrise, about the time you get up, it's time to sing your song again, right? Somewhere around noon, you're having lunch. What should I do? I should pray. And sometime before sunset. It was a habit. It was a ritual. It would pause multiple times in the day to pray. Now, with things like this, it's, it's important that we don't go, oh, yeah, that, okay, now that's a new rule, new rule. Okay, got it. Got a new rule. Some of y'all are rule followers. I respect that. This isn't what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about a better form of legalism where you got you to figure this out, you know, or the way that some of you recovering Catholics have maybe encountered the, you know, you go to confession and say, well, take, you know, take three Hail Marys and a couple of Our Fathers and call me in the morning, like where it feels like that. This is not, this is not a, just a checklist but there is actually something good in even those Catholic practices of just how do you take my connection with God and habituate it in the day. So this becomes like a normal part of my life. Part of what I do throughout the day is I pray. I mean, I mean, the scriptures tell us to pray without ceasing. This maybe isn't exactly praying without ceasing, but it's a whole lot better than praying just on Sundays. That this awareness of the presence and reality of God just, just was part of daily life all the time. So I wanted us to, to kind of look at that question of, of, of ritual and just, you know, do a bit of a, a 30,000 uh, view look at it. And, and what I, I hope will happen today is, is this, this idea of, of ritual, like what are my rituals, will, will stick in your mind. Because here's the thing, everybody has rituals. Everyone has rituals. Because here's what rituals are. Rituals are habits that generate emotion. Habits that generate emotion. Uh, let me give you a couple of examples. So some of your most cherished family traditions are rituals. Uh, I imagine if you have a dinner table, you probably sit at the same seat around the dinner table all the time. Now, there's nothing better about one seat than another, but part of being a family is everyone knows they've got a seat at the table and they even know where their seat at the table is. There's also some bad rituals, like sometimes we get together for our, our big like Thanksgiving meals, things like that, family gatherings, and you ever notice you have the same conversations again and again and again? You have the same fights. If you have a fight, you see the same fight. Oh, it's this one again. That is a ritual. That's a ritual. And that may be a bad ritual, but that is a ritual. We are filled with rituals, things that we do all the time. And if we don't do it or we don't do it in a certain way, it doesn't feel right. You have rituals around Christmas and how you do Christmas. We, I mean, we have rituals in our general patternings of the day. Who here is a sports fan? 
you have rituals. There are all sorts of things that happen in sports that have nothing to do with the sport. Like, so whether that is the pregame huddle, I mean, do we really honestly believe that is going to help the team score more points? No, but the, the fact that you do it together makes you feel better as a team, and sometimes that helps. Or maybe you wear your favorite team's jersey on game day. No judgment. This is, I know you do. Some of you do. Now, now, the rational part of your brain says, this, does not, this is not actually going to help the Mariners win. <laughs> this is not going to help the Seahawks win. It's not going to do that. You know that in your rational brain, right? <laughs> Some of you are like, no. Because your ritual brain, what your ritual brain is saying is saying, it doesn't hurt. So that's why you wear your lucky socks. Because last time, it seemed to make a difference. So you're sitting in front of the TV set, yelling at it in your jersey with your lucky socks on. That is a ritual. It's a good ritual. It's okay. But I want us to understand everybody has rituals. Everybody has rituals. And if you want to change your life, Change your rituals. It's an incredibly difficult thing to do. But rituals are the things that emotionally ground us. They're community rituals as well. We just participated in an important community ritual. This weekend is Memorial Day. And on some level, taking a moment to remember those who died in service of our nation, it's a, it's a pointless exercise. Hang on. Because it, it doesn't stop the fact that they died. So there's a part of your rational brain that says, what's the big deal? Why does that even matter? But the ritual part of you says, this matters greatly. Because... This was a significant sacrifice, and we need to remember it. And it may not change the fact that they died, but here's what it does change, is it changes your and my perspective about it. We remember those things, and we go, you know, some of the people that went before me endured some really brave things. They did a whole lot of self-sacrifice. Maybe I shouldn't yell at the barista because they spelled my name on the cup wrong. Maybe I shouldn't get all in a twitch because the DoorDash person arrived two minutes late. Like, it gives us perspective. So, on some level, it doesn't matter at all. But on another level, it ends up becoming the things that matter the most. Strong communities are built on shared rituals. If you live in the Wenatchee Valley... We love apple blossom, right? That's a community ritual. And it's those kinds of things that help us relate to one another. They, they build strong communities. Um, marriage experts like the Gottmans, um, the, um, oh, John and Julie Gottman, they use this phrase, small things often. They say that's the secret to a happy marriage. It's not so much about the big Hail Mary thing, that big trip that you finally did, or that big one romantic gesture. It's about, do you remember to say, I love you? Do you kiss each other goodnight? What do you do when you leave one another for a time? Is there a time in the day where you call one another? If you're apart because of work or other or family obligations, do you text or call one another? Those are the things that actually matter. And you know what those are? Those are? Rituals. They're rituals. They're rituals. Marriages break down when the rituals break down. Or the rituals become bad rituals because we have bad rituals in the day too. I mean, just, just like when you gather together for... For a meal, that's, I mean, that's, there's a family ritual that we need to talk about. Uh, I read a survey this week where the average American family 
I mean, 85% of the people believe that eating together for dinner matters. The average American family, at least according to this survey, eats together for dinner three times a week. So if, assuming you eat three meals a day, so you have 21 meals in a week, 18 of them are in isolation. If you want to change your family, change your rituals. If you want to build a stronger marriage, change your rituals. And it also tells us that if you want to build a stronger faith, that strong faiths are built ritual by ritual. Because there's, there, there are, again, there's, there's good rituals, and there's also bad rituals. Um, doom scrolling is a ritual. Um, those of you that maybe uh, the term, you know, that idea when you get on, get on um, Facebook you, or you get on YouTube Reels or, or Facebook Reels, or, and you're just, you're just like, wow, where'd that 45 minutes go? Um, now, it does give you dopamine hits. Because, so, like, there's something chemically that's happening in your brain. It's exciting. It's interesting. But it doesn't connect you to anybody. So, it's a ritual. But it ends up being a, a ritual. In many cases, there's even... Significant studies that say that, that the long, like, extended amounts of time on social media have a correlate, at least, to rising levels of depression. It's a habit that generates emotion. The problem is generating the wrong emotion. So there are bad rituals as well. Things that we do habitually, but they don't actually connect us to other people. And they don't make us happier. And... They don't make us more emotionally grounded, which is why taking just a few minutes to think about, so what are my faith rituals? What are my faith rituals? What are things that I can do on a regular basis that connect me to God? Because in the early church, they even made the Lord's Prayer a daily, three times a day, ritual. Now, that doesn't mean we need to do it exactly the same way. But if you want to have a faith with endurance, if you want to have a faith that's got grit, if you want to have a, want to have a faith that can withstand the cultural pressures and tests that are coming our way, if you want to have a faith so that you're able to stay, you know, sane and grounded in what I believe is like the latter half of 2024, if I was going to make an anxiety forecast, there's a storm blowing in. Be ready for the storm. This is not me making a political statement right now. This is me making a, a, like a mental health and faith statement. A storm is coming. Prepare for it. One of the ways we prepare for it is by, we think about our tribe. So who are, who are the people that I'm connected to? Who are the people I'm committed to? Who's committed to me? And how can I deepen that commitment? And we think about our rituals. What are the things that I do every day that either increase my sense of emotional well-being, and especially if you're a Christ follower, my sense of connection to Jesus. What are the things that can do that? And my hope is maybe today you'll walk away thinking about this, you'll be praying about this, and the Holy Spirit will kind of tap you on the shoulder, and there'll be something that you implement, like in, in, your, in your marriage, in your personal life, in your family life, just something that you go, you know what? I, I we, we're going to be deliberate about this. So, um, well, I'm about done. We need to preach the part together now. Let's, 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 let's do some talking. So what are some rituals that have been um, just helpful for you as a family? Like what are, what are some favorite, cherished family rituals? I including if you disagree with me. It's totally okay if you do because I hope I'm wrong. Okay, Ivy, what, what, what's, a, what's a favorite rit ritual? I help my mom with dinner all the time. Making dinner together. That's a good ritual. That's a good ritual. 
What are some other cherished rituals? Oh, D. Okay, here we go. Sorry, camera crew. All right. My husband and I pray every evening together for the protection of this church and all of our loved ones. We just, every night, it's a ritual. Right, you, you pray together. That's a ritual. Um, or maybe even things like saying uh, grace before meals. That's a, that's a ritual. And if you've never done it, even the simplest of, like, rub-a-dub-dub, -dub, thanks for the grub. It's not the best one, <laughs> but it's not all bad. Start somewhere, right? Okay, rituals. Uh, the small things in a marriage. Yeah. So Jim thanks me every evening or every meal for giving him his meal and has taught our children and grandchildren to do the same. And I just, it blesses me. That is a good ritual. That's a good ritual. Let's hear, let's, yeah, I see your hand. Is that a hand? It's okay. No, you're good? Okay. All right. So a family, a family ritual or a helpful ritual of any sort. I know what she was going to say anyway. We do adult dinner and we do kid dinner. So we have two separate dinners and the adults all come in and sit down and have dinner together. And it's our time to talk. It's our time to get everything for the next day out. Our schedules, our planning, you know, things that might have bothered us during the day or that we need to inform about the kids because we've got a big village going on. So yeah. adult dinner has probably smoothed out a lot of the kinks in our village. Yeah, because you've got several, several families kind of raising kids together in your tribe. And, and so you, you find ways to connect. Let's hear another, yeah, another helpful ritual. I always uh, thank God for providing it and for my wife preparing it. Like around meals. Yes, and yeah. so the Trinity, as he tells me, well, don't worry, you're going to help with the dishes. Exactly. <laughs> but but make, making meals together, eating meals together, these are the kinds of things that in the, in the larger scope of things ends up mattering, mattering quite a bit. Church on Sunday, Church on Sunday yeah. becomes a ritual. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Yeah, exactly. Those habits of, of, of being, of worshiping together. It doesn't need to be awesome all the time in, in order for it to still be important. So I am at an age that I don't sleep at night and the good part of social media right now is I have an app yeah. every night I'm listening to scripture right and it goes in a loop and will play for hours and it's it's just so wonderful that's all so um, you you just um, like uh, even if you can't sleep you just immerse you bathe your mind yeah. in God's word it's lovely yeah well, that's why I would think of are there, are there rituals that help you to connect with Jesus? Yeah. Kevin, you got one? Yeah, we've uh, started building a ritual where we go and visit our kids, <clears throat> excuse me, in uh, the places where they live on holidays and make it a family event, but not make them come to us. We go to them. And so yeah, more broke, family right? members yeah. have started yeah. joining and we're, you know, looking forward to it every year now. Right. So, so you have these family traditions that you, that you follow on a regular basis. And those are the kinds of things that build stronger families. All right, Ailette. I have a negative ritual. Anytime we go someplace, Walt usually drives, and I tell him how to do it. <laughs> right. <laughs> Actually, no, I, all joking aside, no, thank, thank you. Because there, there are habits that we get into and there's patterns, right? There's patterns. And, and, and some of them end up being not helpful. Yeah. Okay, I want to leave you with one, one metaphor. And, and do hang on to that idea because maybe there's... I, I hope you'll be talking about your rituals. Here's just a, a little a word picture that maybe you'll find helpful. So imagine this stream of water. Now imagine it was, it's, yeah, it's, I know, it's a weird sound, isn't it? Yeah. I'm, some of you are like, I need a potty break. No, it's easy. Okay, it's ongoing stream of water. Now, now, you know that this stream of water will end. But that's not very much water, is it? No, 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 thank you, don't, you don't need to turn it up. But, here, but here's the thing. If that much water, if I, if I was pouring that out on the, on the ground here, 
if I was pouring it out on the ground on, on, on an endless basis, it would do one of a couple of things. Either it, it would start to flood the floor and it would cause tremendous destruction to this building. Or perhaps it'll make a, a little hole in the floor. There's a, there's a concrete pad underneath here. And that water flowing for long enough, it will bore a hole all the way through the concrete. And eventually it'll get into the soil underneath that and the soil underneath that and the soil underneath that. Look, let me see your eyes. The Grand Canyon is a creek with a ritual. So when you form rituals for your life and in your family's life, you are cutting a channel. Cut the right channels. Because the promise of God that we hear in Philippians chapter 4 it's true. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, y'all, present and keep presenting your requests to God. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding, that transcends all election cycles, that transcends all ups and downs in the economy, that transcends all, all of the shifts in history, all of the cultural challenges that come your way will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. It does not necessarily change the situation, though God can do that. But what it will most certainly change is you. Is you. You and I and we, we can have a different perspective on life if we continue to present our requests to God. As we abide in the vine, as we trust in our Savior, as we live in patterns of connectedness to God. 